And so that's each of the Gulf Islands, and then we were doing three locations on the peninsula, Sydney, uh, Central Saanich, uh, basically Brentwood Bay, and um, Saanich in the Gordon Head area. This is the, uh, in September when the Gordon Head location was so overflowing that people couldn't find seats and people have left without being able to get a seat, that was huge. So we just thought, okay, we're gonna have to do two locations in Saanich, which makes sense, but after having done one in Gordon Head just in, uh, I think it was January 8th, and the second one at Gateway Baptist, I was thinking that we might not have a full house here because people had had their chance to come. Well, this is fantastic because obviously, and I think Craig isn't, isn't kidding when he said just maybe next time. But anyway, uh, so now it's nine locations in the riding twice a year. So we will be uh, probably using the same two locations again. And the 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 rhythm of it that seems to make sense is to present what happens in the winter to spring session of Parliament, uh, it, which which takes me to the end of June that the House is sitting. We usually report on that right after Labor Day, and then, we, and then the fall session reports during the January uh, recess. So the House is now in recess. We've been in recess since uh, uh, towards the end of December. And what I want to report to you about tonight is everything that's happened since the last town hall that we held in the Spanish area right after Labor Day. Now, as you may recall, uh, we, we didn't go back to Parliament uh, when we were expected to go back. Uh, we were expected to return to Parliament in mid-September, but Stephen Harper prorogued the House. And we went back in mid-October. So with the prorogation, I found more, uh, suddenly I had empty days on my calendar. That never happens. So while my weekends were booked, my weekdays opened up, and I just continued with town hall meetings. I took a town hall democracy tour to 17 locations, uh, got to most Canadian provinces, seven provinces, and the Yukon, and in places from Dawson City to Fredericton, did democracy town halls across Canada. So that was quite a, I thought it was a good way to use the time when the house was shut down, uh, speaking of democracy. So, uh, <laughs> back to Ottawa in time for, we, re we resumed in Parliament with a speech from the throne uh, the week after Thanksgiving, the Wednesday following Thanksgiving. Uh, the major news in the speech from the throne was the agreement in principle for the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement. This is the agreement between Canada and the European Union, the text of which is still not available. So if you're interested in what we think is in it, I can certainly try to address that, but the text is still uh, not available to parliamentarians. Uh, after the, uh, the other things that in the speech from the throne were um, not really very surprising, but the the legislative agenda immediately rolled out and as, as uh, has become, now some conservative members of parliament refer to this as if it's a tradition of parliament. It's only a very recent tradition of Stephen Harper, so it's not a traditional parliamentary uh, process that we get two omnibus budget bills. A spring omnibus budget bill and a fall omnibus budget bill. And what that means is that for every budget, budget of 2012 and budget of 2013. Those are the only two years in which this has ever happened in the history of Canada. Didn't happen in 2011, by the way. But you end up with essentially a cumulative total of about 800 to 900 pages of legislation, which is claimed to be required to put forward the budget. And that's, that's not actually the case. A lot of the legislation that's thrown in these omnibus bills, omnibus basically coming from the idea of a Latin for everything uh, at once, and so the, sec the, the spring omnibus budget bill uh, uh, was uh, to the budget of 2013. The fall omnibus budget bill was Bill C4, which we dealt with um, this fall. It, it really had, if it had any theme, it was taking uh, uh, aim at collective bargaining rights of civil service organizations. It had a few extraneous items, um, reducing, for instance, under the Canada Labor Act, changing the definition of dangerous so that it becomes much harder to refuse dangerous work. Uh, there, so again, a labor implication. There were uh, provisions to uh, sell off one large area of British Columbia, which uh, the assets, by the way, that uh, Jim Flaherty, is, our finance minister, is committed to making sure that we're out of deficit, the deficit created by the stimulus spending that was required to the 2008 economic crisis. 
So to get out of deficit by 2015, which is uh, the Harper administration's target, one of the things they're doing is selling off Canadian assets. So you may have noted that, for instance, selling off Canada House in London, selling off some of the embassies that we've had around the world. Those asset sales don't require a bill in Parliament. But this interesting one that was in Bill C-4 is something called the Dominion Coal Lands, and it was uh, several uh, tens of thousands of hectares in southeastern British Columbia, in the area of the Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. These were lands that were, were tied up through legislation back at the time of the building of the railway. So it was the Crow's Nest Pass Act that we had to amend to allow them to sell off uh, lands that will be used for coal mining in southeastern BC. So there are, there are some ecological concerns with that one. There were also legislation, I put forward amendments to all of the bills, of course, including a Copyright Act, First Nations Elections Act, um, a cluster munitions bill. But one of the things that happened this fall that was really difficult for me personally is that, um, and to back up, this is parliamentary procedure, and I'll try not to, I'll try to keep it from being boring, but this is parliamentary procedure. <laughs> and the significance of it was a lot of you will know that I was able to put forward amendments at report stage in the House of Commons on every bill, um, particularly on Bill C-38, which was the omnibus budget bill of spring 2012, which was hugely damaging to our Fisheries Act and destroyed our environmental assessment legislation. And I put forward 400 amendments on that. And the, uh, the Conservatives didn't like that, that I did that. And it's the first time in the history of Canada, it's sort of a backhanded compliment, if I think of it this way, that a majority parliament of a powerful party, the Conservatives, decided to take aim at one single MP to destroy my rights to put forward amendments at report stage. So in that sense, it's a compliment. But <laughs> what they did was they had in individual committees, all the committees of parliament that resumed right after the prorogation, that deal with legislation, simultaneously had motions put forward by conservative members of parliament that were identical. So the fiction here was that each of these members came up with their own motion independent of the others but the language was identical. And what it said was that from uh, that all any time there was legislation with amendments going forward, 48 hours before the committee moved to clause by clause review of the legislation, uh, members of parliament who were part of parties, such as the Green Party with fewer than 12 seats, the Bloc Quebecois, or independents would be quote unquote invited to submit amendments to committee. This is a way of getting around the fact that my right to submit amendments in the House of Commons as a whole, specifically because people in my situation are MPs in parties with fewer than 12 members, are not allowed to be members of committees. So they've, they've, they've created what's essentially not an invitation, but an, uh, an experience of coercion, that if I don't show up to committee with my amendments, I'll, I won't have an opportunity to put forward amendments at report stage. If I do show up at committee with my amendments, they just go through a ritual slaughter before the committee, and I still can't put them forward at report stage. But it's worth the fight to bring forward good amendments. So I've now, actually, it's had the effect of increasing my workload, because I have to run from committee to committee. Sometimes they're meeting at around the same time, and it's very difficult to show up with the amendments and get them heard. I'm allowed a 60 seconds per amendment to describe my amendment, and then, I'm, uh, depending on the committee chair, I'm generally not allowed to defend them or explain them or even respond to an MP who wants to make a friendly amendment to one of my amendments. So that was a big change this fall, but I did continue to put forward amendments to every piece of federal legislation. Uh, and surprisingly, on the cluster munitions bill, the opposition parties collectively, and we worked quite well together, the Liberals, the New Democrats, and Greens, to amend what was, well, backing up again, as you can imagine, a bill before the House of Commons to implement a global treaty on cluster munitions is for the purpose of getting rid of cluster munitions. So the treaty that Canada has signed, but which we have not yet ratified, so that Canada would not use or transport or acquire or develop cluster munitions. The problem with the act to implement this was that it said, but if Canada happens to be 
in a joint military action with an ally that has not ratified the cluster munitions bill, that any armed force member can use, transport, whatever, cluster munitions. So we, and of course the United States hasn't ratified or signed the cluster munitions bill. So you can see where this is going. So we, we were, I was very pleased, it's rare, it's so rare to have an amendment during the committee process, the current administration, unlike previous administrations in all of Canada's parliamentary history, doesn't actually use the legislative process before committees to amend and improve legislation, such as Bill C-38, which I just mentioned, the omnibus budget bill of, of spring 2012, from first reading to royal assent, did not have a single change made in over 440 pages of legislation. It's very, it's, it's quite anomalous to Canada's parliamentary history. We have, of course, the whole point of Parliament is to actually review legislation, as well as, of course, control the public purse, which Parliament no longer does. But it's, 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 it's the core of parliamentary process that you amend legislation as it comes forward. In any case, we did succeed in the cluster munitions bill in saying that although Canadian armed forces uh, can be involved with other armed forces that are using cluster munitions, we removed the provision that said that Canadian armed forces themselves could use them. So at least it's, it was an unsatisfactory compromise, but it was better than nothing. Uh, the other thing that happened this fall that you might be interested in that I did was uh, I went to the global climate negotiations. This time, it, as anyone who follows the climate issue will know that under the Framework Convention on Climate Change, there is a global negotiated process every single late fall, generally in the latter half of November, sometimes creeping into December. And the purpose of that is to find a global binding treaty that will actually reduce greenhouse gases effectively. I tried to go to these. Um, I was the only member of parliament to go this time, other than the Minister of Environment, Leona Aglukuk. And I went there uh, thinking I was going to be registered as, a, as a, uh, essentially a, an observer, which gets you in the main room, but doesn't get you in most of the side negotiations where the real negotiations happen. And after arrival in Warsaw, where this is the 19th conference of the parties that took place in Warsaw, after arrival in Warsaw, and I had my credentials as an observer, but they don't get you in the real negotiations, they get you in the plenary sessions. And what you want to get in the real negotiation is a bright pink line on your badge with the name of a country. Now, I did ask Canada if I could please go as a member of the Canadian delegation, and uh, after I was already in Warsaw was when I got the response from the other blue cop saying no, they were only bringing people on the negotiated group, uh, the, de the official delegation would only include people who were valuable to the delegation because they knew something about climate. <laughs> anyway, but after I got to Warsaw, of all things, I was approached by the Afghanistan delegation. So some of you may know, I ended up being a member of the Afghanistan delegation. <laughs> I wasn't sure what to do about it, really, because I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I have criticisms of the Karzai government. But the reality of the negotiations is that there was an Australian academic, a PhD in climate policy from a university in Australia, who was trying to help this little delegation of three Afghan nationals, the deputy minister of their environment department, someone from foreign affairs in Afghanistan, and somebody who was directing the climate policy. And we don't think about it much. Here's Afghanistan's trying to put together in the last 10 years alone, their whole environmental policy, their, all their laws, their climate policy, and they're saying, look, we're being affected by climate change. We need to be part of the solution. And they also, the weird thing about UN negotiations is that when you go into these side rooms, despite the fact that they're in the plenary, you can get translation into eight languages. As soon as you go in the side room where real negotiations are happening, it's all in English. And only one out of the three Afghan members of the delegation actually spoke but sufficiently strong English to participate. So not to get too much detail on that, but the negotiations were, were quite difficult, not anywhere near as productive as they need to be, because this ongoing process, and believe me, there's a lot of room for criticizing the process in a multilateral context to get to a climate treaty, but I believe it's important. I mean, I, I think it's critical that we use every process we can find. Uh, the deadline for a new 
global treaty including everybody is for 2015 at what will be COP21 in Paris. So I have a different reaction to the news of Hollande's infidelity. All I'm thinking about is if his coalition falls apart, what happens to the December 2015 climate negotiations in Paris? Because that's where they're going to be. Right now, by the way, in, in Hollande's coalition, the Minister of Development is a Green Party member from France. And that's giving us some good, from, from my position, given my party in global negotiations, it gives us some good access and in, inside information on how things are going in negotiations. Anyway, I've gone on too long about Warsaw. We then, I uh, back in Parliament for another week after the climate negotiations ended. Uh, we adjourned on a Tuesday night, so two days early adjournment. I thought, well, I didn't see any reason not to adjourn because nothing that we were about to pass was other than bad legislation. So I agreed to early adjournment. And then the next morning was when Canada Post made its announcements. And the Canada Post situation has come up in, in all the town hall meetings so far. The other, oh, there was one other thing this fall that I worked on is I managed to negotiate when we were negotiating adjournment early in June, that I would only agree to early adjournment in June if members of parliament in my situation, again, the smaller parties and a cluster of independents, were given the right to participate as, uh, as sharing a committee seat on the investigation of a very unusual body called the Board of Internal Economy. The Board of Internal Economy is made up of representatives of the larger parties, right now the Liberals, New Democrats, and the Conservatives, and they're the ones who make all the decisions about things like publication of MP expenses, uh, how we run Parliament Hill, all of those things are basically, I think of it as a star chamber. There's no minutes in their meetings, you don't have any input to their decisions if you're not one of the larger parties. So we actually did participate and wrote a dissent to this report of the Committee on Parliamentary Procedures and Affairs. And it was a, a very good exercise. It worked really well. Imagine I, I ended up sort of being the facilitator of a process to get the input from the Bloc Québécois and from a handful of independents. Oh, and then the last thing, the other thing I should mention, of course, is after adjournment, we also have the decision of the Joint Review Panel, the National Energy Board. I know that might want to be under discussion tonight. So that's, that's a quick report on a survey of what was a shorter than usual parliamentary session running from mid-October to mid-December. We resume in Parliament a week from today, and of course we'll be looking at the budget, but the most excited, one of the most exciting things that happened in that brief period of mid-October to mid-December came from a backbencher conservative, and I'm mentioning it because I'm quite encouraged and I really hope his bill will pass, uh, he's coming, his private member's bill will come up for vote right before my private member's bill for a national Lyme disease strategy comes up. You may have seen it in the media, but a really wonderful conservative named Michael Chong, who's the member of parliament for Wellington Halton Hills, has put forward a very good bill that he calls the Reform Act to reduce the power of leaders of federal political parties, to increase the power of backbencher members of parliament within a caucus, and his bill would remove, which is something I've supported for a long time, remove the requirement under the Elections Act that the leader of every party sign the nominations for every one of their candidates. This gives the leader of a party the ability to threaten their candidates and their MPs and say, well, if you don't do what I say, I'm not going to sign your nomination papers. This is essentially the only clout and, and plausible threat that these guys have, other than saying, I'm gonna you know, yell at you and make your life miserable, they can do that, but it's, this is an important legislative change, the Elections Act, and also Michael Chong's bill would restore Canadian parliamentary democracy to more of what we have in the other Commonwealth countries. Our Westminster parliamentary system is of course shared with the, uh, the UK and all other Commonwealth countries, but Canada's morphed in a weird way, uh, and that's that, Whereas when you think of it, the, the prime minister in other countries in the Commonwealth can be removed by their caucus. So remember Margaret Thatcher was removed not by a vote of the British electorate, but by her own caucus putting John Major in place instead of her. And in Australia recently it's happened twice, where um, Rudd was removed by Julia Gillard and then Julia Gillard was removed by Rudd. Well, in Canada, only because, I think because of our proximity to the United States, we have, a, we have kind of adopted some of the US political culture, 
with the idea that the leader of the party is only elected through the convention of the members, and they've deprived parliamentary caucuses of their right to say, look, we're sick of so-and-so, we're gonna put somebody else in place. So what Michael Chong's bill would do would be to restore what's essentially still in common law and parliamentary tradition, still the rule in Canada, it just has gone into disuse, and it, his bill would say that if 15% of any caucus uh, feels that they want to, they can uh, trigger a leadership review in their own caucus. So it's a very strong <laughs> parliamentary reform. And uh, it wouldn't take effect until after the next election. So, but that's okay. I mean, if we can get this reform bill through, Canadian parliamentary democracy will be much healthier. And so uh, I'm very committed to working to get it to pass. And as things now stand, I know that Michael Chong has the support. I, I would guesstimate, depending on how brave they feel on the day, somewhere between 20 and 40 conservatives would vote for his bill. It is a private member's bill, and uh, there are things that could go wrong with it between here and getting it passed. Uh, that's uh, as much as I should say by way of an opening. I'm sorry I went on so long. I am concerned how many people are still standing. In fact, are there any chairs that anyone has near them? Anywhere else in the room? There's a chair. Okay, there's one spot there. If anyone, is there one or two near you? One? And there's, oh, yeah, well, we can move some chairs over. Yeah, we should make sure, and particularly for anybody who's not comfortable, please signal to somebody else so that we can find you a spot to sit or we can bring out more chairs. I, I have to say, as an exercise in democracy locally, nothing is as encouraging for me as to see so many people wanting to come out and find out what's going on in Ottawa and tell me what's on your mind. So now I'll stop talking. Uh, we'll try to figure out now, do we have more than one mic in the room or do I have the other mic? Okay, so what we'll do is I'll try to repeat questions so that everybody can hear them. Um, Jonathan, you're midway there. If people can help me spot, because I may not see hands that go up, this is probably the biggest town hall we've ever had. I think it is. It's, we've just, we're just, so, and if you could do me a favor, would you stand up? Yeah, it's great. Congratulations. I'm spotting another, I think I see Don Scott right back. Don, would you be a monitor back there in case I'm missing someone? Wave your hands. Okay. If I'm missing you, just you, you too bad. But <laughs> Don Scott's also he's a very dear friend, that's why I can say that. Okay. Uh, hands are going up, so yes. How um, many votes are required to get this amendment for his uh, bill change? Right. The question is how many votes are required to get Michael Chong's bill to pass? Depends on how many members of parliament are in the house that day. So it's going to be fifty percent plus one. Now there are 308 MPs in the House. The Speaker doesn't vote, so that's so we have to get at least half of 307. But not everybody is there every day, and there are some empty seats right now. There are a couple of members of Parliament who have resigned, and they haven't had by-elections to fill their spots yet. So we're down to half of 305. So, but the problem, what I worry about is even if we can get. If we have a good showing of conservatives willing to support Michael Chong, and the NDP leader and the Liberal leader, neither one of them want to come out against this. But the reality of their party structures is that I think they probably don't want it to pass. So the <laughs> risk is uh, a poor, like a poor turnout of Liberals or a poor turnout of NDPers. If every single member of the opposition makes an effort, shows up, and is there on the day of the vote. And they vote in you know full force. And of course, I don't believe in whipped votes. We, I don't think it's appropriate. But I think most backbenchers will like these changes if they're allowed to vote the way their conscience dictates. This should pass. So uh, it will be helpful uh, to have letters to uh, Mr. Mulcair and Mr. Trudeau to say we sure hope that your caucus is not just going to support this with lip service, but knowing how hard it's going to be to get conservatives to vote for this. You know, please do everything you can to get every every uh, bum in seat for this vote because it's really going to matter, and it could be very, very close. Yes, John. Uh, two quick questions. I too am uh, very concerned about the lack of parliament uh, democracy in the Canadian parliament at the time. Uh, two quick questions. The first, unconditional uh, support of the policies of the 
political party currently in power in Israel leads directly to unquestioned support of a military preemptive strike on Iranian uh, <coughs> nuclear facility. To what extent has this been debated in the Council <coughs> Parliament? The second question is with respect to research. The surreptitious destruction of valuable research documents and libraries uh, containing uh, is purely reminiscent of the open destruction and burning of books in Germany in the mid 30s. Here, here. Here, is there any those questions because um, both were you know, complicated and important. The so first one was given that Stephen Harper has shown unconditional support for the state of Israel and all actions of the current government of Israel, does that mean that Canada is implicitly committed to supporting military preemptive strikes against Iranian nuclear facilities and has this been debated in Parliament? And the second question was, given that libraries with federal research documents are being destroyed across Canada, um, this, 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 it, the, um, what's, actually, we didn't get to the question because you were interrupted by applause when he made the point that this was eerily reminiscent of destruction, a book burning in Germany in the 1930s. So the question part was. Has this been subject to reasoned debate in the Canadian Parliament? Has this been subject to reasoned debate in the Canadian Parliament? I have to say, and I'm not, Entirely, I, I hope I'm, it's horrible to say, but I'm not being facetious. Since I've been elected, I haven't seen a reasoned debate in the Canadian Parliament, <laughs> and that's because it's not because parliamentarians aren't capable of reasoned debate. It's because the party control and the partisan, top-down control of the parties means that, particularly the conservatives, but not always just the conservatives, read prepared speeches prepared by others for them which avoid reason and are basically um, ritualistic uh, gladiatorial contests in anticipation of an election, as opposed to reason debate. Uh, we have had no debate in the Canadian Parliament on our Middle East policy since I've been in Parliament. It's very clear to me, and I've, been, I, I've had, uh, it's difficult to, to actually touch on the Middle East issue with any degree of nuance without being attacked by everybody, which happened to me recently. Because I absolutely, and Greens absolutely support the right of the state of Israel to exist, and that we need a two-state solution, and that Canada's foreign policy must be balanced. We have to play, we have to be in a position where we have some kind of role, which we traditionally had in our foreign policy, of an honest broker. that can deal with the Palestinian Authority, can deal with the state of Israel, can deal with both with respect, at this point, as your question suggests, Stephen Harper's policy for Canada is to be more pro-Netanyahu than the average Israeli. That's what's weird. We are, we are cheerleaders for the Likud party. We're not even reflecting the broad range of views that one would find in a reasoned debate in the state of Israel. So this was interestingly enough, Stephen Harper's first trip ever to Israel and he was invited to speak at the Knesset, which is the first prime minister ever to have that honor. But where do we have any daylight between us and Netanyahu? And particularly on an issue as dangerous as how does one hand, I, mean, I, think, I think Canada should be in a position to lobby for a nuclear-free Middle East. Now that would have the effect of saying, no, we can't have nuclear weapons in the state of Iran, and I think everyone would agree with that. But it also means that State of Israel, which has nuclear weapons, would have to find a way to agree. And we also still have nuclear weapons globally that we need to move towards the elimination of, nu of the nuclear arsenals of countries around the world. The, the risk of nuclear terrorism goes way up when any country is developing nuclear technology. So uh, that issue has not been debated in Parliament. And the second issue, and I'm, right now, I'm, I think it'll be my first question in Parliament on Monday, is about the destruction of the libraries. Uh, if you picked up in the back of the room, I, I had a, a, we probably ran out of them, but it's on the website, uh, a survey of the events of 2013 that I did 
right, on New Year's Eve, the highs and lows of 2013. And one of the highs was Michael Chong's bill, and one of the lows is the destruction of the libraries. And there's so many of them. The Science Libraries of DFO, the, the Science Libraries of uh, Natural Resources Canada and on Forestry. Those were destroyed first. Well, they say it's to save four hundred thousand dollars. You're right, but it's not clear that that's even true, right? So, and of course, we pulled out of the treaty for on um, drought certification. I mean, the the the, 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 the pop, just I was going to say piddling, but I will say piddling. The tiny little amounts of money that they claim are being saved by doing egregious things, like pulling out of a global treaty on drought certification, because it cost Canada. $250,000 a year to participate. This is a global treaty, everybody's part of it, and of course the countries of Africa are the most affected by drought desertification. But so too is Canada at risk of drought desertification, particularly because of the climate crisis. And $250,000, you know, if that's not the good spending, if the multilateral good relationships that are built through working for science and sharing information and programs to deal with drought and certification. If that's not worth $250,000 a year, what makes feeding a panda worth a million dollars a year? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a point which I, I've, I've lately fallen to use, using panda equivalents because they, they come in very handy in terms of where the priorities are. So, uh, yeah, so the question that I want to ask in Parliament, I'm, I am doing some research on it, and I was speaking earlier with a gentleman who worked in the federal uh, government library system. Under the Libraries Act, the destruction of collections is not supposed to be arbitrary and without review to ensure that critical information that is part of what the people of Canada own, which we have put together over generations, is not lost forever. So I don't think that the destruction of the libraries was actually legal. So I'm going to be pursuing that when we resume in Parliament on Monday. software developed, instead went to the UVic co-op and got two, U two Canadian en engineering students who did the whole project. He said it cost him less than if he'd outsourced. He doesn't really think that you save money by outsourcing. What you do, though, is you avoid having to deal with a unified body, maybe a local union. You, your labor is so stateless that it becomes yet another input to production that is completely separate from any notion that these are, are people that you care about. So it gives, it gives management more clout with labor because labor has increasingly fewer rights. But it didn't actually, it wouldn't have, I don't know that TELUS actually saves money doing what they're doing. They, they may have crunched all the numbers, but this particular local businessman told me he costed it out, and at least in his context, he did better with Canadian kids. Now, of course, the full context of the economic impact is, if you hired Canadians, they're spending that money locally. Whatever they earn is spent here in communities, stays on Vancouver Island. 
The other example, of course, of the statelessness of capital and the globalization and commodification of everything is the temporary foreign worker program, which is exploitative of the foreign workers because they're not allowed to accumulate any rights in Canada nor any ability to come here to stay. And if they, they're only allowed to come to Canada on the temporary foreign worker program under contract to one particular employer. So if, for instance, they see something in the workplace that isn't kosher and they want to raise that as a concern, they're going to be shipped right back to their country of origin. So they don't like the XL beef plant had all mostly temporary foreign workers in it, and that's where the E. coli uh, contamination happened about a year about a year ago. And those workers in the XL beef plant weren't in a position to say we can't maintain sanitary conditions when we have to to actually deal with 300 carcasses an hour, which was the rate at which they were supposed to be doing the one slice that each worker did repetitively on a carcass as it moved by. So the Temporary Foreign Worker Program in Canada, as of, I think I've got this right, I think it was 2009, was the first year in which the Temporary Foreign Worker numbers were larger than the people accepted for permanent residency in Canada. And as of the end of, at December 2012, Canada had over 344,000 temporary foreign workers here. And what I'm wondering is how exactly, shame, we have youth unemployment is holding firm at 14%. And how many Canadian young people don't get a crack at a job because the employer has chosen the temporary foreign worker program? So it's, it's, uh, there are, now, if you wanted to say, your point was, we should make it illegal to use these programs, under the World Trade Organization laws and under various trade treaties, we are no longer allowed to say, these jobs are only for Canadians. So we, we end up having to, I think we have to read, we have to look at our tax, we have to look at the incentives and disincentives so that we can encourage Canadian business to hire Canadians. We certainly need to look at the Temporary Foreign Worker Program because it was designed by, with the myth that it was going to be temporary. And it was designed on the notion that it's there to fill labor shortages, skills shortages. If we, were, if we had close to full employment in Canada, you might think that there's no reason not to have 340,000 temporary foreign workers. But when, when youth unemployment is at 14%, it is not an acceptable public policy to make, uh, to create this exploitative program for foreign workers. So I agree with you, but the trade rules make it really hard to ban it. We certainly can reduce the number of temporary foreign workers because that's entirely at the government's discretion. And I think we need to be much more economically literate about the impacts of preferentially sending outsourcing our work, which of course out also outsources the salaries and the consumer behavior that happens when local, when your when your Canadian public <clears throat> is employed, the social issues of ignoring youth unemployment are another whole issue and are large. You look at what you know the, the rise of fascism in, in in Europe in the 1930s was directly related to persistent youth unemployment. Now, I'm not suggesting Canadian youth, if left unemployed, are going to become fascists, but the social conditions that protect healthy democracy. You compare what happened in the depression between Europe and Germany and North America. You saw that one of the things that FDR and the New Deal did was protect trade unions and encourage full employment because that protects democracy and that also ensures that your middle class is strong and healthy because if you don't have a strong and healthy middle class, democracy is, is much, much more precarious. So that's a bit of a rant, sorry about that, but I completely agree with everything you said except I wish we could ban it, I don't think we can. So the hand there in the, yeah, with the cap on your hand is right up, yes. Well, hi, thank you. Uh, I'm a reporter with WeAreChangeVictoria.org, and just in light of the, the last question here, I want to ask you in terms of jobs and the, re, the, the pipeline debacle, um, where would you stand in terms of helping our economy with the reindustrialization of hemp products in Canada? being that it can be used for petrol plant-based petroleum products, we can use it to for carpet, we can create the chassis of an automobile with hemp. But they've outlawed hemp for the last 60 years or so. If you support hemp industrialization in Canada, what steps would you take to, 
to grow this avenue for, for new uh, uh, income? Okay. Well, it, it happens that at least my party policy, and I personally support the legalization, taxation, and regulation of cannabis, period. At the same time, the non-THC uh, hemp has tremendous potential for non-tree paper, for all kinds of materials from fabric to, as you say, to, to chassis. And it, it, for parts of Canada's uh, agricultural sector that's really, that particularly tobacco farmers, southern Ontario tobacco fields, hemp is a perfect substitution crop as more and more farmers want to get off growing tobacco and on to growing non-THC hemp. The, the kind of uh, reefer madness laws that make no sense make it very hard to also have the industrial hemp activity taking place. So I'm entirely in favor of uh, uh, getting rid of silly laws, and that would also allow us to have law enforcement agents, agencies uh, prioritize their work in law enforcement on things that actually are a threat to public safety and security. And it's not saying um, in any blanket way that, I know your question was about non-THC hemp, but in terms of cannabis, personally I think there are health risks with cannabis and we should not be promoting uh, the use of cannabis. But in the same way we don't promote the use of tobacco, but it's legal, and we don't promote excess alcohol consumption, but it's legal, and we should treat cannabis exactly the same way. So that would, I think if we regulate, legalize, and tax cannabis at the same time that we start exploring all the various ways that hemp can be used as part of um, a new industrial sector, it'll all get a lot more straightforward. So yes, you can yell it back there. I've been hearing a lot of rhetoric about uh, nuclear weapons in the Middle East and the proliferation of them and all the rest of it. And I'm not hearing anything about nuclear power plants, which Canada is great for producing. We've got over 400 worldwide leaking. We had Chernobyl, we had Three Mile Island. Now we got Fukushima that nobody ever talks about that is melting down and totally destroying the Pacific Ocean, Japan, and soon the west coast of Canada. And what has Harper done? He shut down scientists, he's muffled them, he's shut down our radiation uh, detectors. What are you doing to turn this around so the people of Canada are made aware of what is really going on to our planet? Well, I, well first of all, I'm glad you asked the question. Uh, nuclear proliferation for weapons is also very closely tied to the spread of what's so-called peaceful nuclear energy. And this is a position uh, when Canada used to have an ambassador for <laughs> nuclear disarmament within the government of Canada, it was a wonderful former progressive conservative MP named Doug Roach. Now, how many of you know of Douglas Roach? Anybody who's followed nuclear disarmament issues will know him. And he's made this point very strongly that any push for more uh, nuclear energy plants inevitably leads to greater risk of nuclear proliferation for weapons and, of course, the risks of terrorist acquisition of nuclear materials. So I favor, and the Green Party favors, the phase out and shutdown of nuclear energy uh, globally. In terms of Fukushima, what have I done? I did put out, uh, we're the only, I'm the only MP, I think, that's put out any press releases at all. Not that press releases really help, goodness knows, but because they don't get any coverage once we put them out. But I did call for, at the time Fukushima was happening, for public monitoring, for public information in Canada. Canadians were getting much less information than U.S. citizens. And when it became apparent that the groundwater leakage from Fukushima was still reaching the Pacific at alarming levels, I wrote to John Baird, Minister of Foreign Affairs, to Gail Shea, Minister of Fisheries, and to Rana Ambrose, Minister for Health, to, and oh, to Jerry Rich, Minister for Agriculture, to ask for monitoring of foodstuffs, particularly seafood products that could have been swimming through the waters in Japan, to ensure that if there was any radi that there was radiation monitoring and information provided to Canadians, um, arrange they're all all of the things that I, I haven't yet I double checked because Fukushima has been coming up at other town halls, so I double checked with my office in Ottawa. I haven't had any response from any of the ministers to whom I wrote back in August about what we were seeing happening with Fukushima. But the letters and the efforts are on the website. I'm grateful that it gets raised in the town halls because then when I go back to Parliament. I can say, look, people in my community want to know what is this government doing. I will tell you that in terms of my background and knowledge on radiation, 
I don't think that we need to panic about our food now. I was very concerned. At the time Fukushima was happening, uh, there were a lot of airborne radiation that could have been affecting milk and dairy products. We weren't monitoring for it. We should have been. We should have been providing some cautionary advice to Canadians. Right now, I think there's reason to be concerned uh, in terms of seafood products, but we don't have any, looking at what they're getting from the United States, it still doesn't look as though we have any reason to be panicking. So don't panic, but we have a right to information and we're not getting it, so I'll keep pushing for it. Now, let's see, who other hands that I haven't spotted from? Yes, you on the aisle there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hi. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Elizabeth. I just wanted to do a quick shout out for a local, a local issue um, before we're going to leave here tonight, and I'll just be really brief. Um, we're working with local farmers and local politicians as well um, to protect the ALR in British Columbia. We have a problem with our farmland bank uh, being eroded by our local government, potentially uh, being taken under the um, control of the Ministry of Agriculture. So we may lose our, our ALR and our ALC uh, self-governing body to protect farmland. Only 5% of BC is protected and in the light of food security, um, we need more farmland, not less. So I will be passing out flyers. There is a petition and a poster. We're having a huge rally at the legislature on February 10th. We want everyone there just saying, uh, speaking out to our government to protect the ALR and leave it as is. So we just put the petition. I think you give them the applause your message carry, but this is not obviously a federal issue. I don't mind shout outs for local issues. This is a town hall with people who are both living municipally, provincially, and federally, and globally, so we can mention it to producers. February 10th rally in front of the ledge at what time? Noon. Noon, there we go. Okay, yes, you have been patient. Well, this is kind of a general broad question, Elizabeth. I wonder if you have some sense of where our Canadian Parliament is at, or our Stephen Harper Parliament is at. How does it fare out, how does it deviate from the other parliaments? UK, Australia, New Zealand. How far off course are we? <laughs> okay, this is a great question. How far off is the Canadian Parliament from parliaments around the world? Uh, how much do we deviate from, for instance, how the UK Parliament functions? And can we, if, if we lose it, how do we get it back? Uh, there's no question. This is this has been a shock to me because I worked in Parliament in the 1980s. I have a good uh, level of knowledge, and actually, I'm one of the only members of Parliament who actually has any institutional knowledge to know that what's happening right now is wrong and scary. It's it's interesting how many MPs, when I tell them, look, I worked in the Office of the Minister of Environment in the 1980s. Mulroney was Prime Minister, and I was the uh, senior policy advisor to the Minister of Environment, and I wasn't a member of any political party in those days, I was just working on policy. But I tell conservative members of parliament, and for that matter, New Democrats and liberals, that in those days, the Minister of Environment would give, would give a speech, and I, I helped him write speeches, and we didn't run it by the Prime Minister's office first. No one would have imagined that we had to. And they're shocked because this is where the institutional knowledge is broken down. They think that what's happening now is normal. They think it's normal to be given uh, a speech that they've never read, that they're, which I said, it's sort of like bad high school drama as they stumble through uh, bad attacks on the other side of the house. And sometimes, you know, they're, they're not, their heart isn't in it. That most members of Parliament are really good people and very civic-minded. So things have gone far off course, and the reason that things have gone off course is the disrespect towards Parliament as an institution, particularly from Stephen Harper. Now, it would be wrong to suggest that no Prime Minister in the history of this country has been described as a dictator. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey Simpson wrote a book on Jean Chrétien called The Friendly Dictatorship. Um, so this is the unfriendly one. That's <laughs> <laughs> where we get the difference. And it's, there's been a steady rise since, well, since the advent of the law that Michael Chalk's bill would take apart. Since 1970, leaders of parties have, only since 1970, leaders of parties have the requirement to sign the nomination papers of candidates. This has given more power to leaders of parties. At the same time, around 1968, Pierre Trudeau created the notion that there was something called PMO, the Prime Minister's Office. It did not exist 
before Pierre Trudeau. It was under uh, Lester B. Pearson, and I spoke to, before he passed away, a wonderful man named Tom Kent, who had been principal secretary to, to Lester B. Pearson, described Lester B. Pearson's office as, which would have been called the Prime Minister's office if anyone thought about it, a handful of file clerks and stenographers. There were no power brokers, spin doctors. Well, now we're up to Harper's PMO is $10 million a year of completely partisan spending for conservative hacks who run roughshod over their own caucus, who muzzle scientists and bully the bureaucrats. And yeah, so it, it needs to be fixed because, frankly, I'm very concerned that the next person who becomes prime minister will find it very convenient that all the levers of power who run absolutely everything in Ottawa are on one desk, his. Right? So, just, I, I'd say hers, but the only way it's hers is if it's me, and I would just go. <laughs> so I'll be dismantling all it. So we have to fix it now. We really do need to fix it now, because the, 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 it's an unholy degree of power that the Prime Minister's Office has. Uh, when Kevin Page was speaking in the local Green Party, we have an eminent speaker series, and he spoke at UVic. If you missed it, you can find it on YouTube. It was a fantastic speech. But Kevin Cage said, as the first parliamentary budget officer, and his speech to us was his first speech after leaving that office, he said that every single institution of parliamentary democracy is under assault. That's how I see it. That's how he sees it. And he said that in terms of the levers of power, the, the principle of parliamentary democracy is that the public purse is controlled by parliament, and that is no longer the case. The last budget, by the way, budget 2013, it's the first time I've ever reviewed, I've been reading budgets since I used to work at Sierra Club. Every year you go in and you get to lock up and you read the budget. The budget of 2013 is the first budget I've ever read from the federal government that didn't include any numbers. <laughs> It was, it, now, of course it included some numbers. It said we're going to spend X amount on this, we're going to, but there was no tabular summary of what each department was getting. So there was no point of comparison of what each department got in 2013 compared to 2012. There was no summary at the back of the document that showed where the money was being spent. So there were just, you know, sort of, you know, we're going to give X million more to Via Rail, but you didn't know, okay, so there's $54 million more to Via Rail, but what's Via Rail's total budget? You couldn't find it. To get to those numbers, you have to wait for supplementary estimates. So the budget document is increasingly a public relations vehicle for the party in power. And, and again, that shows a contempt for Parliament, because a budget is supposed to be an actual budget, and when Parliament passes a budget, it's supposed to be our job as MPs is to actually safeguard the public purse and debate it properly. And if you don't have access to the information, you can't do that. So it's, it, it, in answer to your question, how bad is it? It's really, really bad. Just, yeah. oh, I've got a follow up here. You know, I bring this up because uh, 30 years ago, I ended up picking up a boat of Vietnamese refugees in the South China Sea. Just some people looking for freedom. I don't want us to get to that point. <laughs> And I didn't know anything about democracy or freedom until I saw that. I'd seen it on the news, I'd seen it in Time and Newsweek, but it meant nothing. Until I was receiving people looking for freedom, it meant something. I know it now. I don't know who else knows it, but we're losing it. You don't get it back when it's gone. Did everyone hear what you said? <laughs> standing up and fighting is that it's pernicious and almost invisible and our news media is failing us. Yeah. <laughs> if it was invisible as a, an overt takeover, I like to think that Canadians care enough about democracy, freedom and our rights that we'd be marching in the streets. As it is, you can barely get letters to the editor written because it seems kind of like it can't be really that bad. But it, it, I thank you for, for putting it so passionately, because it is that bad, and we should be standing up. Now, I'm looking for hands. Anyone who hasn't asked a question yet? Yes, um, Don's pointing to someone in the very back. 
And then I'm going to give you a hint for where we're going. After that, I'll go to the gentleman on the aisle who's wearing the blue t-shirt, and then the lady in the front row. So we'll go one, two, three, and then we'll start again. Yeah, the, the, the situation for a Canada Post is extremely worrying. I think you know where I stand. The Cup W research has been very strong in showing that if we want to maintain our postal service, we have to be prepared to be creative, and we have to look for ways to diversify the functions of our post offices, including doing what they do in some countries, of opening up postal service to include banking service. There are a lot of things we can do to, make, to ensure that the Postal Service maintains its profitability. But the reality is, it's still making money now, yes. and although letter carrying and letter delivery to a door has gone down, because of the advent of internet shopping, parcel delivery is going up. So we could absolutely, and I think it's, I think it's a minimum service myself of a civilized society, that, you're a, that you can mail a letter to anywhere in the country. And the idea that this is a concern for seniors who want to get more exercise, climbing <laughs> over snow banks to get to these. The, it, and in much of Canada, the idea that urban service of mail delivery is going to be changed so dramatically with no discussion, uh, and the morning after we adjourned, I, I, I'm, I'm appalled by it. Let me just get a sense of the room because sometimes I hear that people don't care. How many of you would are upset by the changes that were recently announced? Great. How many of you think we don't need a post office service in Canada and we can all go with private mail delivery? And, okay. Okay, good. So we have a sense of the room. So we'll, we'll just keep working on it. It's, it's, I think most Canadians are quite distressed by it. What time is the rally? At noon. Post office rally at noon on Gates a week from today, January 27th. Thank you. I'll be there in spirit. I'll be in Ottawa in reality. Okay, on, on the aisle there. Um, so, um, very soon, as you know, I'm thinking there will be the upcoming hearings for the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline, the Kinder Morgan shipments, and Saanich Gulf Islands is part of the ground zero of the vastly increased uh, tanker traffic. Um, I guess I wonder, first, is it appropriate that a member of parliament may or may not uh, uh, apply to be an interventor uh, in this process? Uh, and also, I kind of wonder, you would know principles among the, 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 the organization of Islands Trust. I wonder, I wonder if you anticipate that Islands Trust will be, will be uh, uh, and then the, the shout out is, you know, we have only until February 12th if anyone chooses to apply to, to, to present or submit a letter to us for that hearing. But I wonder what, what I'm planning to, oh, do the question carry? About, okay, Trans Mountain, the Kinder Morgan Pipeline Project, they opened up very recently, January 18th, I believe. There were full page ads saying you can apply to be an intervener at the National Energy Board review of the expanded capacity of bitumen diluent shipments out of Burnaby and through the Port of Vancouver. And of course, it is very much closer to us if those tanker traffic, if that tanker traffic expands, it's very close to Spanish Gulf Islands. We only have till February 12th, so it's less than a month, for the window to apply to become an intervener. So the, the question the gentleman asked me was, would I, is it appropriate for me to apply to be an intervener? Do I plan to? Will Islands Trust intervene? And just to make sure people here know about this very narrow deadline. Uh, I, I've already gone on the National Energy Board website. It's not an easy process. So I've started the process of giving myself a nap. Every time I get a few seconds, I'll go back. But I plan to get myself Registered, and then I'm interested to know if they will accept me as an intervener, because after Bill, we're back to Bill C-38, where they repealed the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act and put in place a bogus um, act on environmental assessment, which leaves out public participation. Essentially, it says that you can you can participate if you're directly affected. The previous Environmental Assessment Act, which I helped work on back in the Mulroney years, which got 
ultimately Royal Ascent right after Crackshan came in, but that was the window in which we were working on good environmental assessment legislation. And by the way, it was never all that good, but it was a lot better than before Harper took an axe to it. But what it used to have as a fundamental foundational pillar of federal environmental assessment in Canada was to encourage public participation. And now they've drawn it into a very tight uh, narrowing of scope that says you have to be directly affected to participate in the hearings. Now the legal jurisprudence around directly affected is usually taken to mean such a thing as you live next door. Directly affected is a very narrow uh, form of words. And there have been challenges already at the Line 9 review. This was the first one. It's the reverse of Line 9 in Ontario to, to be able, begin to move products west to east instead of east to west along this length of Enbridge Pipe that goes between Ontario and Quebec. Uh, a lot of people have found they, they can't get in to participate because of this new definition of directly affected. Forest Ethics, by the way, uh, hired Clayton Ruby to go to court to challenge it in relation to Line 9. Depending on when that court case finishes, that could have some implications for the way they're applying it on Kinder Morgan. I plan to see how far I can take it. I also wanted to go through the experience personally of getting through the forms because they're somewhat daunting. Uh, but I encourage everybody here who's concerned about pipelines and tankers to go to the National Energy Board website. I think if I, from memory, I think it was N-E-B hyphen uh, E-N-O, Energy Nationale Organisation, je pense. Anyway, so it, it's, it's it, or you could just Google National Energy Board uh, Kinder Morgan and find your way to their website. See if you can register, see if they'll let us participate. Uh, yes, you were the next one. Um, I know a lot of discussion about Senate recently has been to do with scandals, so, Totally ignoring all the idea of scandals. Before that, I was starting to do something about Senate reform. So what, if anything, is being done about Senate reform? Okay. So the question is about the Senate and about what we hear about is scandals, but what's being done about Senate reform. But the difficulty with Senate reform, as opposed to the, the suite of things we've talked about so far for parliamentary reform, I've left out one of the important things of parliamentary reform, for instance, getting rid of the first past the post voting system, having proportional representation, eliminating the prime minister's office. I'd love to eliminate it, you know? If it just didn't have any money, if it was just filled with earnest volunteers, I wouldn't mind so much, you know? But anyway, but the set, all of the things that we need to do to fix the House of Commons can be done without opening the Constitution. So the big hurdle on Senate reform is you can do almost nothing in the Senate without the consent of most provinces, and you have to go through the exercise of opening the Canadian Constitution, which is fraught with risks because once you open that negotiation, who knows where else it will lead. It's hard to just keep it focused on only the Senate. In terms of Senate reform, um, Personally, I was always a defender of the Canadian Senate, just from my experience of working with the Senate when it was a good place. Now, it was never perfect. You always had some lazy hangers-on who took the money and hung out in Mexico. But, <laughs> or people who seemed to be on life support. But, <laughs> I mean, not to make fun of them, but really, the bulk of senators historically have been good. The work of the Senate historically has had real merit because you had people who weren't worried about winning at the next election. So you had things like, I don't know how many of you have ever been interested in soil erosion, but one of the landmark reports ever done in Canada was done by a senator named Herb Sparrow from Saskatchewan, whose committee wrote a landmark report on, on soil erosion. And then there was the bovine growth hormone uh, recombinant uh, DNA, so a genetically modified uh, drug for cows, which they use in the States, to increase milk production. The only reason it's not registered in Canada is that the Canadian Senate held hearings and subpoenaed the scientists who thought it was a bad idea and made it impossible for the Minister of Health to approve it. Monsanto at that point, by the way, had offered the Cretan Minister of Health at the time, Alan Rock, the Department of Health in Canada had been offered a $10 million research grant from Monsanto if we registered bovine growth hormone. The only reason it wasn't registered was because of the Canadian Senate. So there was a role for sober second thought. But back to what's gone wrong in Parliament, the PMO now believes it can control senators. And this has become very transparent through the uh, wonderful 
interesting reading, 80-page affidavit of the RCMP looking into the spending scandal has opened a little bit of a window on how people in PMO are saying, these senators, they're, they're giving speeches they wrote themselves. They're not even clearing their speeches. But so there's this sort of a, a, a fit happening where the, the, the spin doctor guys in PMO realize that the Senate, from their point of view, the Senate has gone rogue. They don't understand that it's a separate House of Governance, separate from the House of Commons, therefore nothing to do with the PMO controlling them. But Harper has appointed, and it's, I, I hard, it's hard to generalize because there may be a good center in the mix, so I apologize for offending anyone, but basically the independent thought, the policy excellence, the potential for people actually doing a good job in the public interest in the Canadian Senate has plummeted given the appointments Harper has made. So now I've actually moved to Senate abolition personally because I'm terrified that, well, what these guys have done with the climate bill that Bruce Heyer brought in, it was passed by the House of Commons when the House was a minority conservative dominated House with Harper as Prime Minister and minority parliament. A bill was passed for climate action, got through the House of Commons, and when it got to the Senate, Harper told conservative senators, take your first opportunity and kill it. They killed the bill with no legitimacy, not elected people. They killed the bill passed by the democratically elected House. They killed it before it ever went to committee for study. So right now, I think the only way to clean up the Senate, and it's almost impossible to fire a senator, the conservative dominated Senate is going to be a real problem. And I don't know how we're going to reform it unless we open the Constitution. So I think the priority has to be on reforming the House of Commons. If we could reform the Senate, I think you'd almost do better to say, let's find a mechanism to fire all existing senators, and then just have a lotto, and uh, <laughs> like a jury duty, and you know, a whole bunch of regular people would have to go to the Senate, and they'd do a better job. But I mean, I'm not being, I mean, the Senate reform issue is a big one, but it's almost impossible to fix in real political terms, because you have to open the Constitution to fix it. I'm sorry it took so long to answer that. Oh, now there's one. I'm going to go to the lady in the gray there, and then the lady in the middle there, and the gentleman in the doorway. So that's three this way, and then we'll come back and go to you. Okay, I'll remember. One, two, three, and then four, five. Okay. Given oh. how dangerous first past the post is, again, a system with four parties, three of them to the left of the governing party, what do you see as some realistic way to fix this? Could there be a court challenge? Realistically, in our lifetimes, perhaps. <laughs> Realistically, to fix the voting system for this country, I think we need to follow what happened in New Zealand. New Zealand is a Commonwealth country just like Canada, where there are enough perverse results for the big parties, which has certainly been happening. Right? So the Liberal Party, for instance, would have had more seats this time under proportional representation. The NDP would have had fewer, but the Conservatives would have had many fewer. Obviously, Greens would have had more. But if we need to get the issue of proportional representation and getting rid of first past the post much better understood across the country so that it can become an election issue, uh, the, my personal effort, it's not just personal, it's the Green Party of Canada, and I'm sorry for making this partisan, I don't like to make anything partisan, this is a nonpartisan meeting, but in terms of the realistic prospects, at least my mandate from the party convention for the Greens and the resolution that was passed there by our members was, that I am to pursue electoral cooperation with any party that will work with us to get rid of first past the post. So I'm hoping, I mean realistically it could happen, that I could get the Liberals, the New Democrats to agree that we'd all work together, get rid of first past the post, and form a coalition government after the next election. The difficulty is that so far they don't want to talk to me about it. But you can talk to them about it. And, and we'll just keep pushing. And if people are not familiar with these issues, I recommend you have a look at the website of a group called Fair Vote Canada, because they have a very good, useful, step-by-step -step explanation of what's wrong with First Past the Post, what alternatives there are that other countries use. And I think the more Canadians know about it, please write letters to the editors of newspapers to explain how dysfunctional it is to have a voting system that allowed us to have a majority of parliament, a majority of conservatives in the House of Commons, based on 39% support 
of the 60% of Canadians who voted. So it's a really dysfunctional system. Now, let's go ahead and cross that. Yes, you're next. Um, I grew up in uh, apartheid South Africa where um, uh, surveillance of individuals was, you know, very frightening and rampant. And um, with online surveillance, and um, we don't know the extent of it, but recent, uh, well, today, when um, Stephen Harper was talking about, um, with reference to and a member of the United Church of Canada that recently took a stand against um, boycotting uh, certain products from Israel. And uh, his reference directly to that was that um, that was anti-Semitic. So how worried should I be about surveillance and, you know? <coughs> Privacy rights and civil liberties are under assault as never before. Uh, part of it comes with the post 9-11 uh, fears, which are fanned and encouraged by people who don't want to have privacy rights why? and civil liberties. So we're told, why would you worry if someone wants to open your emails? You only have to worry if you've got something to hide. So we need to be, I, I think there are a lot of people, and you know, uh, the, the WikiLeaks and the Snowden and the various things that have, and the fact that Barack Obama has now had to apologize to Angela Merkel for tapping her, hacking into her phone before she was even Chancellor of Germany. Now, none of us here are Angela Merkel, but the, sur the online surveillance and, and the new technologies that make it possible to sort of cluster a whole bunch of emails and, and sift through them for key words of concern, some of this is legitimate security work that we want to have done so that we're safe. But civil Whoa. liberties can't be trampled in the process. So it's, it's really important. I think the fact that um, in the context of pipelines and tankers, as we talked earlier, the fact that CSIS, the RCMP, and the communica Communications Establishment Security Canada, I don't know if you've heard of Communications Establishment Security Canada, CSEC, it's a strange outfit, but it spies on foreigners for Canada. It's the outfit that hacked into the government of Brazil Department of Mines computer in what appears to be industrial espionage on behalf of Canadian mining companies. Mm -hmm. So we've got some, so our, our friendships and our allies can be obviously very offended by us. But CSEC and RCMP and CSIS, getting back to where I was, uh, have been offering twice a year briefings for Canadian energy companies on activities of threats to pipelines and tanker projects. So Western energy, Western Canadian energy projects have had these briefings. And I found out about it, many of you probably saw this too, it was published in the British uh, newspaper, The Guardian, including a, a, pro, a, a program for the day that said that this briefing on security threats to pipelines included coffee breaks provided by Enbridge. <laughs> so you start, you know, at, at this point, what we really need to do is be pushing for much more robust civilian arm's length uh, watchdogs over the surveillance agencies. They cannot also be the consul on the desk of a prime minister who has all the authority. We need to have, we do not have adequate citizen civilian oversight, particularly of the Communications Establishment Security Canada. Uh, and and that because we're not going to stop surveillance, and I think most Canadians wouldn't want us to. They want to have some assurance that I mean, at the other end of the spectrum, what's going on at an airport where they give the kid his pipe phone back and say, go on to the plane? <laughs> so you've got this kind of disconnect between uh, extensive surveillance, which we're told is about watching out for people who might get a pipe bomb in an airplane, and then, you know, you sort of freeze in your boots if you've got too large a tube of toothpaste. So I don't, I don't, I think the only solution is respect privacy laws, enhance them, respect civil liberties, and ensure that there is robust oversight. Right now in Parliament, we don't have anything like the appropriate level of oversight of the agencies that are empowered to spy on all of us. And I'm not comfortable about it. I'm sure, you know, I, so I, I, I share your concerns, but I think we can do something about it. Now, I've gone this direction, and yes, in the doorway. Yes, thanks, Elizabeth. I wanted to ask you about a, a local issue, but it's also an environmental issue. It also involves federal regulations and federal funding. 
and that is the proposed sewage project. Um, before you answer, I'd like to remind you of what Donald Galloway said in the last by-election when he was asked this question. Uh, he said he asked 10 different scientists about it, and they all gave the same answer, that it's not scientifically justified, and it's a low environmental priority. Okay. Well, I, I, you would throw me to address the question. Number one, it's, uh, I, there is no question that most scientists who've looked at it say in the, in the immediacy of where is that sewage going in terms of being put into a, a very fast moving channel, is it coming back and causing problems, there are most scientists I've talked to would say exactly what you quote Don Galloway is saying. On the other hand, it is completely, I think, unacceptable for a wealthy industrialized country like Canada to have any uh, sewage dumping into the ocean because, as other reports have said, long term, it's not a sustainable response. So we do need to have sewage treatment, but ideally we should have a sewage treatment process that makes some sense. And I think the current proposal, the idea of pumping biosolids, as they call sewage these days, to a heartland landfill, I mean, it, it runs the risk of converting a non-priority ocean pollution problem to a priority land pollution problem. So we, but we also don't want to lose access to the funds. So the approach I would pursue, if it was in my riding, and if I could, if, if Donald had won, um, would have been to try to get the federal government to, to uh, lease about four acres of excess space that they, that they own around his final naval base to put in place a, a treatment system that, was in, that included tertiary treatment that got better control than what they're proposing, that dealt with uh, some of the, uh, uh, we've, done, we've done well by the way, there were, there were a lot more uh, toxic heavy metals that were making their way into our waterways and we've done a lot with, uh, and the CRD has done a good job with reduction at source, such as with mercury amalgams and dentists. Mm -hmm. There's been a number of, and, and car body shops, there's been a number of places where things going down the drain are reducing the amount of toxic loading in our oceans. But we've got, we do have to have sewage treatment for Victoria. I'm, I'm firm on that, but this particular plan, to me, is compromised by the awkwardness of not having a sufficiently large footprint for a plant and the unwillingness to put distributed smaller plants. So you end up with essentially, a, you know, it's like a, a camel being a horse designed by committee. There's something kind of funny about a plan that involves building a pipeline to a, I don't even know that that, that, that plan is going to work. The, the pipeline could plug, it, it's not necessarily a good, well, it, it, I, I've, been, I've seen a number of projects that went wrong because of trying to move things up hills and down and forgetting about the engineering that sometimes these things will plug and not work very well. It adds to the cost and it reduces the energy capture that you could get. So I, I, I always approach the issue of sewage in Victoria with some trepidation because second only to the Middle East, it, it's an impossible topic to discuss with any <laughs> Mitchell and I would certainly agree with what you just said. Yeah. And there is a local effort to <clears throat> propose a higher level of treatment, a distributed model, just as you, you stated. There is a petition here tonight. Okay. So the petition that you have here tonight, you wouldn't mind if people found you afterwards so they could sign it? Absolutely. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you. That was my only question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Thank you for being so patient. Hi. Would you like to, I'm going to pass you the mic and I don't have to repeat your question because you're so close. Um, I was wondering if you could please uh, summarize your Lyme uh, disease strategy bill mm -hmm. and why it's so important for Canada and Canadians. And uh, could you please tell us how best to follow in detail when you introduce it in Parliament? I want to watch you live. <laughs> you want, so please, please do it. Thank you. Well, the Lyme disease strategy bill is Bill 442. It's had first reading, I got it through first reading in June of 2012. How many of you know anybody who's been affected by Lyme disease? Pretty high proportion of the room. How many of you have Lyme disease? Okay. It is, a, it is an epidemic. It, is, uh, it needs a much, uh, needs a national approach. And my bill will go to second reading, I believe, sometime in February. It depends on a calendar that I don't control. I will definitely 
uh, publicize on the website the minute I know anybody who's on any Green Party lists or Elizabeth May MP, uh, dot CA has a newsletter which is not partisan. If you sign up for Elizabeth May MP, dot CA for a newsletter, I promise you, you'll never hear a single thing about the Green Party, nor will anyone ever write and ask you for money. It is a no risk information system that's non partisan. And I can definitely make sure everybody knows when it goes for a vote for second reading. On my website right now, there are petitions on this bill. What, what the bill does, and I'll run through this very quickly, is it calls for a national Lyme disease strategy based on a consultation that includes the medical establishment, the provincial departments of health, because a lot of this is provincial, Lyme disease <laughs> sufferers, the medical community, and others to come up with three things. Better prevention, you know, so public awareness, what to do to avoid being bitten by a tick, what to do if you think you've been bitten by a tick. <laughs> Two, better treatment, better diagnosis, sharing of best practices between and among the provinces and the medical <coughs> of, uh, doctors and others who are researchers who are working on this. And three, search for a cure for those who are, who are you know, we, we, right now the treatments, I don't know how many of you know this, but so many people end up going down to the United States to get massive antibiotic treatments there because they can't get Canadian doctors to provide it here. If you're, if you're diagnosed quickly and correctly and you get that treatment, you're, you're, you can be completely restored to good health. If you're misdiagnosed and you wait a long time, it, it, it can be very debilitating over a very long period of time. So we need to get it passed and I'm optimistic that we will get it passed. Once it gets to your second reading, it goes to committee for study, could get amended there, comes back from committee, goes to third reading, then it has to go to the Senate. But I'm really hopeful that I can get the bill passed and in law accepted, royal assent, the whole nine yards before the next election. And you've got a sub subsidiary yeah. question? Do you know what kind of uh, support uh, that you may have from other MPs regarding this bill? And are they, you know, understanding that this is very comparable to the HIV epidemic and that this can actually be passed through blood transfusions, which how Canada is not screening for. It. Yeah. So the question is what kind of levels of support do I have from other MPs and how where are they? And I'm just gonna summarize that quickly. I'm really thrilled to tell you that Libby Davies is health critic for the NDP says solid NDP support. The Liberals Kirsty Duncan says solid liberal support. And from individual conservatives who have spoken with me, I believe I have a majority of conservatives too. So the only risk is if it, if it becomes politicized. So I don't want it to be seen as my bill. I don't want it to be seen as a green bill. I would I'd be thrilled if the Minister of Health, Rona Ambrose, took it on and made it a conservative bill. I just want to get it passed. So uh, if the, the petition online, if you have friends and other writings, Please get the, the, the petitions have to be, like, well, we probably have one back there, but they have to be signed as paper copies. They can't be just signed online on computers to be presented to Parliament. If, they, if you can find MPs who have, you know, if they, that are obviously not me, you don't need to send it to me anymore. Send them if you can get people who live in a riding with a conservative MP and they get 24 names on petitions. At 24, make it 30 in case some of the names are wrong they present them in the House. That's how many you need to present a petition in the House of Commons. And it's a very good way to sensitize the other MPs to the degree of concern in their own writing about the issue. And then, yes. um, do you want this to do this time? This is a follow-up question. Um, it has to do with um, the co coalition of trying to basically get Stephen Harper out. Um, is the only, uh, the way I heard you was that the only way to do that was through voter reform. Is there another scenario other than voter reform that the coalition could be formed? Okay, so the question is, and I'm going to repeat the question, and then I'm going to remind everybody this is a nonpartisan meeting, and if anyone feels uncomfortable with me answering it, just flag it, and I'll t answer it later just to people privately. So the question is that, did she understand correctly that I was saying the only way to, to have Stephen Harper no longer be Prime Minister was through a coalition effort or voter reform, and if it's not voter reform, is there any other way that one could imagine that Stephen Harper wouldn't continue as Prime Minister? So, another, no. Is there another way of forming a coalition? Is there another way of forming a coalition? Without voter reform. Without voter reform. Okay, so well, that's sort of a theoretical parliamentary question. But does anyone, I, I'll try to keep
keep it from being partisan. Yes, I mean, Canadian parliamentary democracy, just as in any Westminster parliamentary democracy, uh, allows for coalition governments. Uh, that's what the UK has right now. It, it's got the Lib Dems and the Conservatives, Nick Clegg and Gordon uh, Camp, Camp, Cameron, together in, in a coalition government. Uh, that's what's normal in other countries. One of the problems, again, is because we're so close to the United States, when there is an election, um, did I say Cameron? Cam Gordon Cameron. Yeah. Wait, Dave, 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 Dave Cameron. Okay, thank you. I think what's wrong with you. Anyway, um, the the um, when when Stephen Harper in 2006 had more seats than anybody else than other parties, but still a minority. That voting result in the UK or in Australia or in New Zealand would have been reported in the newspapers as, we have a hung parliament, who will form government? But the Canadian media and our Canadian political culture has begun, has aged US politics more and more all the time. So we just say, Harper won. And we go, no, 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 no. And we also focus too much on the leaders. Instead of saying, okay, well, who are the parliamentarians? How is that gonna work? What kind of government are we gonna have? So we, can, we tend to skip a step when it's a minority parliament. Next time there's a minority parliament, I'm really hopeful that I'll have a caucus of 12 MPs. Right now I've got a caucus of two. You probably heard that. We have a second Green MP, so I've got a caucus of two. Well, it's not every day you can double your caucus, so I'm really happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy about that, but if, if, assume that whatever form of, of parties, maybe I'm not even there. Let's not assume that I'm even in the mix. But if you have a minority of a liberal minority, conservative minority, NDP, the way our system works is the leaders of those parties would talk to each other and say, can we work together? Would we put together a coalition? What would it look like? And so it's totally possible, it's actually normal in Westminster parliamentary democracy for that to occur. And the reason it happens so little here, or actually at the federal level, it only happened when um, uh, so was Sir John A. Macdonald, and the initial government of this country, was the Great Coalition. Uh, since then, we've had a minority parliament, Lester B. Pearson, worked extremely well with the New Democrats. That was a very fertile period for Canadian democracy. That's when we got in uh, the pension plan, we got in uh, health care, a lot of things. We got in a new flag. A lot of things happened in that minority parliament, and we just have to, you know, understand that and push for it. Now, there, there's, we're po pointing to a hand back here. Who have you got, Don? Oh, great. Thank you very much for giving voice to youth and children who have really important things to say as well. So I appreciate everyone who's been patient enough to let kids come. Um, we have uh, some kids here from Campus View Elementary School, and they are fans of yours, and they would like to present an invitation to an Earth Fest. They started a green team at uh, the school, and they'd like to uh, extend you an invitation to our fest. So if they could come up and give that to you. That would be great. Well, do you mind as well, you guys are coming towards the front if I take a quick question just to use time well. Do you mind if I do that? And come on up, kids. I, I will stop talking the minute you get here. Thank you. Before I ask a question, I just want to thank you for the commendable job you're doing. Okay.
So I'm going to answer that question and repeat it for everybody, but first I'm going to accept this invitation. First I want to know, I don't want to put you guys on the spot, but would you mind saying your names and how old you are? I'm Ella, and I'm nine. Mm -hmm. I'm Raina, and I'm 11. And I'm Lee, and I'm also 11. Okay, well you have something for me, and I'm very honored that you're here, so tell me what it is. Who wants to be the spokesperson? Um, so this is an invitation to the Campus View Elementary um, Green Team Oath Fest. This will be a third annual um, Oath Fest, and we're really excited. So you're not nearly as excited as I am. <laughs> so I'd like to come. So the proposed dates are April 23rd. That's the day after Earth Day, or April 30th, or May 7th. And so maybe I can talk to you guys. And I will definitely, as our local MP, we invite you to please join us and hear what the leaders of the future have to share. You know what, the only thing I'm going to disagree about? <laughs> I don't think they're the leaders of the future, I think they're the leaders right now. <laughs> okay, we'll talk later. So the question before, thank you so much, by the way, Anita and Narda and Laura, thank you very much. from Campus View Elementary Community Earth Fest uh, is counted as failing as, as peacekeepers. We now rate something like 58th in the world in terms of our commitment to peacekeeping. We do continue to donate money to U.S. peacekeeping efforts, but we do not send personnel. We've been specifically requested for the Congo several times. Uh, General Andrew Leslie, who's now retired, actually told me at the time he wanted to accept the invitation, they were looking for three people. They weren't looking for thousands, they wanted three people. They wanted people who were capable of command to ensure that the mission in the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where there's been an incredible loss of life, that they would have a good, well-qualified uh, military strategist, expert in general. He wanted to go and uh, Stephen Harper said no, we couldn't spare anybody. Uh, so I think, you know, the peacekeeping efforts are, were invented by Lester Pearson before he was Prime Minister when he resolved the Suez Crisis for which he won the Nobel Peace Prize. I, I think we have to return to those peacekeeping roots. Uh, it's, uh, it's always been a source of pride to Canadians. I, I work with a lot of peacekeeping veterans who live in the community in Sydney. I rode with them and the, it was such an honor, they asked me to, to ride with them on Canada Day in the Sydney Parade. I got in trouble with some people because they had a really big Cadillac that I rode in. But anyway, <laughs> you're, gonna, you're not going to get an 89-year-old peacekeeper putting me on the handlebars of his bicycle. So I, I, it's true. So, I was so we do need to do this. Uh, it's one of the ways that Stephen Harper is trying to remake our idea of who we are as a people is by repeatedly describing Canada as a warrior nation. It's a, it's a little, and I think there's nothing, we, we, it's a very tricky, slippery slope to, to, uh, to change language. You do not want to, for one minute, to denigrate the, the fantastic people who join the Canadian military and put their lives at risk and are in missions around the world. We need to support those operations. It's not always going to be peacekeeping. But sometimes it's got to be peacekeeping, and, and so we need to put ourselves back in front of peacekeeping because we invented it. Uh, so there's a hand one up. Was it related to this one, sir? Yeah. Well, it is related, yes. Seeing as we are a, a warrior country, I think our prime minister should get in front of our troops and lead the charge. <laughs> Our treatment of I mean, Stephen Harper has also been, I think, in the history of this country, the least supportive of veterans. And, and losing the veterans' offices across the country puts tremendous pressure, by the way, on the Canadian Legion, which is doing a great job trying to provide services for people who have post-traumatic stress disorder. We are not doing enough for our veterans by any means, and we are also letting them down in terms of lump sum payments for disabilities and so on. So, 
it's, it's an, it, I find it ironic that he would position Canada as a warrior nation and then fail to take care of the people who are returning from war and conflict zones. So uh, we'll be pushing on that as well. Look, I'm aware of the fact that we're almost out of time. When, how long do we have this room till, Jonathan? Nine o'clock. Oh, okay. Well, if you don't mind, I'll keep answering questions then. Um, that I saw a couple of hands going up first. There's the gentleman standing next to Mark Newfeld, and then there's the gentleman, uh, oh, I'm not quite sure, I can't quite see if it's Emma, yes, then you. And then, who, am I missing any? I'm done. Yes, the very back. So we'll do one, two, three, and then I'll cluster back towards here. Okay. There's uh, more and more people in Canada and locally uh, expressing greater and greater concern about the particulate spraying of air, uh, uh, aerosol material being distributed by uh, jet aircraft. Um, uh, personally, I just recently uh, interviewed at Clifford Carnicum of the Carnicum Institute, and uh, we were interested in what the Green Party's position is about trying to expose this matter in a more open form debate as uh, magazines like the Angora and locally run media are trying to bring this to the forefront. We can't seem to get any platform to discuss it because it's a, it's a matter of great concern for the environment. Yeah. The position is of the Green Party and me personally is I'm, I want to find evidence that allows us to take a position that it's actually occurring in the way in which you've described it. I think, it's, I think it's quite possible, I'm very concerned about geoengineering, I think it's quite possible that there's a government somewhere in the world that thinks it's a good idea and we currently don't regulate it, we don't have any global treaties against the distribution of particulate matter in the upper atmosphere. There are a lot of people who've talked about trying to reduce the impact of increased CO2 by actually deliberately distributing particulate matter to lead to an artificial